the way that we're bringing up children right now is not working terribly well. I mean, for example, um, there are, there's research coming out of the States that shows that there's been a real decline in empathy in college students, you know, measured now compared to 30 years ago. Um, depression is becoming an absolute epidemic. We somehow think that disturbed children are an alien species, even though the narrative around adult recovery is polluted with theories and possibilities. When it gets to children, suddenly there is no narrative, but the child is evil. If there's a relationship between a mother and a toddler at age two, that's not affectionate. You know, there are, there are very direct links between that and, and later antisocial kind of behaviours. Um, I mean, it starts incredibly early, basically, because we learn how to manage ourselves, how to manage our feelings, right at the beginning of life. And if we haven't learned well, you know, we, we sort of carry on. If we put our money into supporting families, supporting parents, supporting very little children, we are less likely to have stabbings when they get to be 15 years old. In 2004, by coincidence, the World Health Organization produced a report on violence. And it said that violence was a public health problem. And it should be viewed and dealt with as a public health problem. And that was one of our light bulb moments. Because then we thought, right, okay, if you start to think about violence, then you think about bullying, all the way through to suicide and everything in between. Violence is a behaviour. And so if you have this individual who's born into a household where there's, where there's violence, and um, where he's been treated with violence, where he understands that, where that's the only thing that he understands, then when he moves outside into an environment that's there, that's how he'll live. You bring a child up in a war zone, you'll create a warrior. When they get old enough to be able to run away from the family home, they run away with a legacy of disturbance that's completely altered their physiological and cognitive capacities to bias them towards surviving violence. And people who are in comfortable spaces start then disposing judgment. They call these children morally flawed, feral, antisocial, and so on. Whereas actually, these children are completely appropriately adapted to the conditions from which they emerged if you work in the inner cities, is about one in five children are being chronically maltreated at home. We presume that if you make legislation, you'll fix it. And, and politicians will think it's fixed. Look at antisocial behaviour. We, we made antisocial behaviour illegal. Didn't fix it. We just made it illegal. It just, it's just absurd. So making smacking illegal was not going to make... It already is. And I said, and you need to stop using the word smacking. There's the first thing. Start using the word assault. Start using the word bullying, because it's a big person hitting a little person. So stop using the S word. And that would start to change attitudes about it when we do that. But, I mean, I don't want to put everything down to child rearing. It's also the culture. So then we make parenting choices that it's more important to earn the money to pay for the bigger house or the, you know, the car we want or whatever it is, rather than take the time out to, to be with the child. Um, and then it, then it goes the other way. The child who doesn't get the attention tends to behave in ways that are less relational, less, you know, enjoys relationships less because they're more, um, insecure, unconfident, or angry and aggressive. We're in the, in the throes of creating a society in which materialism has become valued over everything else. And so when people go out and um, decide to, you know, loot and riot, um, and we're to assume that it's just a kind of sudden uh, rush of criminality, and don't think about what's behind it, and what's behind it is that they're watching other people with their snouts in the trough um, getting away with it, whether it's bankers or members of parliament or whoever, that 
why shouldn't why shouldn't we? Um, the line that I, I heard was, um, why shouldn't I get this stuff that's worth loads and loads of money if I can get it for free, you know? Um, that feeling that they have, that um, they will be happy if they own the thing they've seen, if they're wearing the right clothes, if they've got the product. That feeling is deep in here and it's been put there as a substitute for the feeling that they're loved. Um, if they'd spent their time being talked to and played with and sung to and just knew that mum, dad, whoever it was, was there, then they wouldn't need to go out and loop and rob because um, there wouldn't be a yawning emotional gulf inside them. If you're being told that the way you're going to be chosen for love is in the handbag you carry and the shoes you wear, well then people will buy the handbag and the shoes. We allow these wealth-making fashion exhibit leaders to dominate. Uh, they're basically playing our vulnerabilities uh, and that's what they're doing to our children. I mean, if you think about the billions that are spent on marketing budgets every year, um, and how little there is in terms of being able to inform parents about the need to talk and cradle their children, to sing to them. And, and the fact that, that the two are working against each other because marketing does not want us to do the free stuff. It wants us to pay the expensive stuff. Right now, I'm not sure we actually like kids. We tolerate them. I mean, everything we do is about getting them out of our lives and, and, and away. And we need to get back to that notion of, of, of where we are with it. Some young men will go through life up until adolescence and never see a positive male role model. And, and we need to recognise that there are issues in that. But we need to think as well, they're parents of the future. And the chances are they weren't parented. So it's not a skill that we're born with, it's not a, a serum that we can get injected with, it's something we need to learn. <laughs> Desperate to make money from everything we see, we've turned birth into a business deal and death to opportunity. As a million timid mums-to-be believe the high street brand, receive shopping lists for newborns handed out like birth implants. Man, marketing emotions as necessary, buys as grands are spent from guilty feelings, pregnant fears and cries. A hundred heavy bellies walk the aisles bulging with advice and tags are placed on everything an unborn baby's price. Trolleys filled by worried parents, patents push the price declaring, products for those up the duff like if you don't buy this you'll your baby up. Now love is seen as birthing pants, polka dot nappy bags and fold out mats, Tupperware boxes sold for hundreds as special sterilising buckets. Profit margins rise each year, collecting coins from newborn fears as love is sold in paper packets, mining class designer jackets, Mercedes cots and racing prams, soaking up another grand and grand are statements, Johnson's Johnson's never heard such fucking nonsense. Baby oils and wipes and creams when water's all you really need. As we hand out every ounce of cash as the products produce the nappy rash. Splashing newborn skin in petrol lotion, paraffin two pound a potion. Electric singing baby toys since when did parents have no voice? Read the stories out yourself, get a book down off the shelf, rock your fucking kid yourself and let them see and hear and smell. A hundred quid for a high street hug as packaged parents spend for love. Scared they'll f their children up as high streets rake the profits up. <laughs> granny, <laughs> granny, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. I don't think my parents' generation talked about parenting. I don't think parenting was a word that existed in, in our parents' generation. My mum, I mean, I'm quite old, so in my parents' generation, it seemed instinctive to her, but admittedly, she was a teacher and she was very good at it, and it sort of seemed to come naturally. I think we angst about parenting quite a lot. I think we're the first generation to apologise to our children. Britain 
now lives in a culture where actually we don't have a whole lot of interaction with babies before we get one of our own. So it's not surprising that many parents would say, and what am I meant to do with this kid now? I don't feel very confident. I don't know how to read them. They're often confusing. They cry a lot. I feel overwhelmed. I feel really tired. I miss my chums because a lot of them were at work where I felt um, active and uh, engaged and innovated. And, and now I'm home with it, doing something I don't feel very confident about. Um, in, in not very many weeks, I know actually that I'm going to start to lose pay, so I'm anxious about that. Um, my mother and my support system may be at the other end of the country because I don't live near them. Uh, my partner hasn't got very much leave and therefore isn't home very long. Um, we were in the hospital for 24 hours and then we got kicked out and I'm meant to go home and just get on with it. Sometimes as midwives, we get phone calls with questions that, that seem quite difficult to understand. But then you, you suddenly think, but this woman has never handled a baby before. And you wouldn't go into a new job without any training. Here you go. My mother always said to me, you can't learn about looking after babies from books. But I have to admit that when I had my babies, I read books all the time. And I think what we tend to do is go to the parenting manuals that reinforce our point of view. The parenting manuals and the television programs of the nannies who tell the parents to expect the baby to sleep, to be only fed every four hours, to go into routine from the minute that they're born, to discipline the baby. Some of the manuals, I think, border on child abuse. Um, Gina Ford, it seems to me, has come out of this culture, post-feminist sort of culture, where we're all absolutely obsessed with work. And I think Gina Ford's a sort of answer to that. She's helping parents to fit their babies in to the working day or the working routine or whatever. And it's very parent-centered. It's not child-centered and it's not, um, it's not really about what children need. Emotion. But what children need more than anything is to be loved. There are basic principles about it, to see their parents loving each other, to be given time, to be given, to be read to, to be talked to, to have time spent with them. That's what children want and need. Again, all boys and all girls are different. So to me, I'd say the first thousand days are the ones that you want to make sure as a parent that you or somebody who loves your child as much as you is giving them constant, consistent, one-on-one -on -one loving care and attention. It's not just about mothers. It's also about fathers, and it's about everybody who's part of children's lives. It's also about grandparents, and it's about aunties and uncles and siblings. You always used to say the concept of being a mum goes beyond gender, and I think that's quite a complicated idea, but I think it, it is that mumming, you know, people talk about mothering, but I think mothering can come just as well from a man as from a woman, and it's, it's, and it's, about, it's about nurture, and I think the concept of being a mum is about nurturing, and actually both parents, if given the chance, are probably quite good at that. And I didn't change a nappy for two weeks. He did everything. Our first child, because he could, he was off for two weeks. He did absolutely everything. And he had to teach me how to do bath time. He had to teach me how to do the nappy. And then he went back to work. You know, three weeks, months later, I don't, I'm like, don't do that, don't do this, don't do this. And suddenly I'm the expert. And I felt quite sorry because he was just as good at it. You know, he was, he was into it and he was enjoying it. And it was a shame. I think there are statistics that if the, you know, the men stick around longer and do more and are more involved later on if they were more involved earlier on. If I could set up my ideal midwifery service, I would have midwives that looked after the family for 18 months after the birth, and I would have them with a class that talked about 
how they were parented, just encouraged people to talk about how they were parented and how do they want to be as parents? Do they want to do it differently? Because I think it can be integrated into midwifery. Since I've had a kid, I feel like one again. Desperate for a steering hand, my mother's help, extra hugs, reassurance that I'm doing great whilst not knowing what the hell I'm doing, but hoping it's okay. I'm like a learning, yearning kid again since I had a kid. A very, very elite group of women get the chance to bring up their children without distress. For the majority, the other 80%, the decisions are tough, unsatisfactory, guilt-ridden, damaging. Until, until men are allowed to be fathers, women won't be allowed to be mothers in the workplace. Until you actually give men flexible working and acknowledge that that's an important role, then as a woman, you're always going to be penalised. It's an unfinished revolution in some ways. We really need to kind of get to grips with the working world because that has never taken into account the needs of families. The real challenge comes when you have, when you have small children. And that's when your feminism is tasted, let me tell you. Because you want to be around your children, and yet at the same time, you know that to succeed in the career that you've chosen, you're expected to be there. You're expected to be doing it with this, the same kind of you know, time commitment as the guys. And it's very hard. And I see young women in the law, you know, I, I call it machismal mothering, you know, where they feel an obligation to kind of give, give the birth and be back at work within weeks of doing so, and never having the opportunity Opportunity of really spending time um, with their baby. It's about thinking that people are parents, people, employees are parents as well. And I think we could do so much more, maybe through legislation, but at the moment we're just trying to do it through sharing good practice from company to company and saying, how can we facilitate parents who we've paid to educate, you know, we've trained up, they've been in the companies, how can we make it easier for them to work and be parents? Because actually being a parent is also really important as well. And so I think we're stuck in this situation in which women actually, when they have babies, um, together with their partners, have this big decision to make about what am I going to do about my work in the world and looking after my baby properly. What's happened over the last maybe 20 years is that a whole load of new information has come about um, what children need, how they develop and so on which has really thrown a spanner in the works because we were all, you know, happily sort of in our power dressed, you know, going to the office thing um, and putting children in nurseries and thinking this was the way to do it. And now there, there are some real questions about, you know, whether that really is the way to do it. All workplaces should have in-house uh, crashes that mothers can leave their children with, but also go back every hour to check on that child. So at least they get 10 minutes together rather than uh, none at all. You know, and for that to happen, there would have to be serious funding and maybe a tax incentive. You know. But government isn't thinking like that. It just takes one group of women and describes the world according to them. of what the article said. Reconsider dad's place at the hospital beds. Nemesis to generations gone of men spouting the same old song of woman's instinct maternal minds. Through male and macho crap you shine. 
dripping energy onto my tongue in bottled drinks and calming songs. As shivers took my body hold and vessels burst in birthing groans, you grabbed her, you cleaned her first, you cut the cord, you saw the worst, or as you seemed to say, the best a man could ever see. Granddads didn't dare. They sat outside with concerned stares, puffing smoke to passing ticks, no concept of what women did. You stand opposite to history, the sight, how like some clown glory, while other men brush off and say that gory birth is not their taste. I feel the pain is soothed by praise. You bragged about my strength that day. The things I really want to shout, but I'm told a lady won't let out. As women undermine themselves, underplay the pain they felt, we need more men like you to tell the tale of what we all went through. You're the opposite of what the article said, that men shouldn't be at the hospital bed. Because you calmed me, laughed through a room full of pain. And now you shout out the strengths that I'm not meant to say. Having a baby has a potential for huge joy. It's and I think that that's what we've forgotten, actually, that giving birth to a baby is challenging, it's painful, pregnancy is uncomfortable, but actually it's hugely joyful. And this is what women do all over the world, is when they've had babies, they meet up and they talk about their birth and they go over and over and over it. And, and I think you find every time that they talk about it, it becomes more exaggerated, their experience. How many women come to you and say, I had an orgasmic birth, it was amazing? They don't need to talk about it. So the only ones that you hear about are the ones that have been traumatized by their experience. Then the media picks up on all of these stories because that's all they've ever heard. And they put on a birthing experience. And if you had somebody who had the most beautiful, serene, calm birth, viewers would turn the television off because there's nothing to see. It's just calm and nothing happens. So it's not good watching. So it doesn't sell. It doesn't sell programs, it doesn't sell magazines, it doesn't sell papers, it doesn't sell stories. The, the surveys that have been undertaken um, show that very few women choose to have cesarean section. There is a kind of culture in which the threshold for cesarean section has been made lower so we're more likely to undertake a cesarean section. Um, and it's, it seems to be much easier to do a cesarean than to wait for a woman to give birth naturally. And I think that we've really underestimated that our mind and body are connected. And if you feel relaxed, if you're in control of your surroundings, if you're comfortable, um, it's far more likely that you will labour well and you, you won't need any assistance with your birth. Think of mammals, you think of horses, when they birth, if they're frightened, they stop. So they will go away and they will come back when they're ready to have their babies again, when it's safe and when they feel that it's, it's a good time to, to produce their offspring. And so when you walk into a consultant unit, you're fearful. So the first thing that happens to you is that you stop. And so walking into that room, full of fear because of everything that you've read, your body slows down. And so a medical person will come in and they'll say, well, you know, your body's not working that well. Why not have a bit of hormone help? You know, let's put a drip up and start the process going. So then you start that process of speeding up your labor because they're there and they may be tired, they may be disappointed that they haven't continued in labor. And then, of course, everything started for them, so things progressed very quickly, and, uh, or not necessarily quickly, but much more accelerated than they would have expected. So mentally, they're not prepared for that. So then they say, I need pain relief. So they're offered a cocktail of pain relief, whichever they choose, probably end up with an epidural. With the epidural then goes all the, the things that can happen with an epidural, that you know, you lose sensation, you can't birth easily. So therefore you end up with your abnormal delivery with a Vontuz or forceps delivery. All that woman needed was to be told to go home, relax, cuddle, come back when she's in labour. And it's actually really simple. We have a number 
of medical interventions that will help women who have medical problems, but that there are a number of women who don't need those interventions. And I think we need systems of care that actually support women in going through childbirth um, in a way that will, it will support the normal physiology. It will help the woman give birth naturally. Well, you have to be allowed to birth in an unobserved, relaxed way. And when you do that, your body works perfectly. And so taking yourself from the birthing room environment in a hospital is probably the first thing you should do or make the environment um, acceptable. You know, a large percentage of the population can have their babies at home. 60 to 70 percent of women can have their babies at home. And that is an enormous amount of babies a year don't need to go into hospital to be born. And they don't need doctors to help them have their babies. When I've had a week of 12 a.m., 3 a.m., 5 a.m. wakes, a new mum awake in a zombie-like state. When you do go to sleep, and I need to sleep too, I spend another three hours just gazing at you. After birth, um, the baby's brain is really developing at the most rapid rate it'll ever develop. They are really magnificent creatures, you know, they, they're le I mean, they're just absolutely soaking it all up. And a lot of it is non-verbal. Um, so they're really kind of just absorbing how, you know, what's this world really like and how are things done here? And how do I relate to people? And how do I manage myself? And all sorts of very basic things are being learnt in those first two or three years. One of the many fascinating things about the neuroscience and the psychology is that it helps us to understand that babies understand tones. From weeks old, they come into the world already tuned in to other people's emotional states. You need the love and the care of a maternal carer. It could be a father or an aunt, but someone who is in that maternal capacity and literally the eye contact between mother and baby and the soothing behaviors of the mother and the mother's brain waves start structuring uh, the neuronal pathways in the front area of the baby's brain and it's right behind the eyes that's why that eye contact is so important and the babbling between mother and baby is so important because uh, in responding to the baby the mother, in effect, is saying, you exist. This is my response to you. This is how I will calm you down. And the strategies for calming that the mother uses is programmed into the child's brain. And the idea is that initially the child is reliant on the mother to do that soothing for them. But as the mother moves away physically more and more, the child is internalized that soothing ability and can use it for themselves. And so it's being held, being rocked, um, being touched. Um, it's the tone of voice that you use. It's feeling that you're in a benign atmosphere. It's knowing that when you, you know, are distressed or uncomfortable, someone will come fix it quickly. So, because obviously as a baby, you can't fix it. What babies are building a brain and a physiology for is an understanding of what love is. So is love something that is comfortable and reliable or is it something that makes me anxious? Is it something that's fearful or something that's joyous? One of the biggest stresses for, ver for babies and very young children is to be away from people who are safe and familiar to them. And that's because a long, long, many eons ago, if you'd been left alone in the jungle on your own, you'd been eaten by something dangerous. And so evolution set it up so that children don't want to be apart from people they care about. Through the experiences that we're having in very early life, we're actually building up this part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which can manage those reactions um, 
and soothe us and calm us and the biochemistry gets into action to soothe us and calm us. And, um, so that can either happen well or it can happen not very well and that affects our ability to manage stress throughout life. So when you get upset, can you calm down? That's what attachment theory basically helps us to understand, is how do we all emotionally cope when we're stressed. When you get to adulthood, can you manage pretty well in connection and disconnection? So when your partner goes away to work, can you manage the day okay without them? When you have a fight with your partner, are you confident that, you, that you're going to be able to talk this out later? Or do you get so distressed, you get lost in your distress because you got emotionally disconnected? Or do you actually not feel comfortable in connection? Or does your partner not feel comfortable in connection? So if you spend a lot of time saying, why won't you look at me? Why won't you talk to me? Why can't we connect? It may be that they actually feel more comfortable in disconnection. And you can't have a happy, fulfilling relationship unless you can manage emotional intimacy and emotional partings. And so it's, so it's in early childhood that you develop the emotional and physiological capacity to go in and out of connection in relationships. And, and I think when you just understand that little bit, suddenly lots of things begin to make sense. And attachment theory becomes much more than just a theory. It's something that we're all living and we may not even understand. I, th I do worry that sometimes people that, that get into attachment theory think the mother must put herself out for the baby. No, you together work out how you're going to do it. And your needs are as great as his needs. And so it's a tuning in and a reciprocal balancing until you, as the adult who knows where you're going, pulls them in the direction that's going to work for everybody because soon they're going in the social world and they've got to be do able to do all the other things that people do in the social world. And that's what it's about. And it takes about a thousand days to get them there. Uh, the beauty of the emerging brain narrative is that actually it's the human experience that sculpts the brain's capacities. And genetics gives you a framework. So genetics says definitely you won't grow wings and fly. But within that, the capacities that you can develop are absolutely determined by what is put into you by your carers. And in that respect, also, it means that if you have had trauma and challenges, if subsequent care arrives, there can be reparation, either by compensatory neuronal networks being developed, who then modify the damaged response, or the damaged response itself not being required and diminishing because it's just not needed, you know? And that's such a hopeful story whilst it points out to us that we have to take immense responsibility for care because you are generating uh, the fundamentals of another human being for the rest of their lives. How does movement, simply children's walking, children's learning to crawl, intersect with language development? What? Children's learning to crawl has an impact on language development? Yes. That's why it's so fascinating. But if you spend more and more time strapped into a buggy or strapped into a car seat, you actually have less time to move and to crawl. And all of the movement data says that will affect the way we develop language. So now we start to think, why do we seem to have so many children who have delays 
in language when they start school, maybe it has to do with the amount of time they get to spend crawling. What you find is that all of these, what seem like different issues, actually start to come together in children's development. If only we would all play like children still play, I don't think we would be so depressed. Picking myths out of daisy chains, lip sit and whispering sounds into practicing breaths. If only we could still see the world as they see it, of colours and textures and sounds. Without words blocking beauty, just watching it all, as we label in language and drown. If only we could still gaze on objects as they do without knowing their functional use. Eyes flicker in awe at the kettle's first steam, or a boiling pan's cloud-shaded hue. If only we could feel the ground as they feel it, without thought of the cause or effect. Lick the cold of a stone as our fingertips roam into soil laid and mud-covered wet. If only we could still move like children still move, let notes jolt our limbs as they like. Waving arms into spasms as laughter erupts, throwing tired chest down into night. If only we would wake up as children still wake, ready to take on the day. 6 a.m. sunlight, already alive, impatiently waiting to play. During the first three years, we're looking at 75 to 80% of the entire brain growth that happens in your lifetime. You know, the creation of you as a person, the way the networks work. So, What's happening in those first three years is really, really important for particularly three things that, um, the, well, the, the neuroscientists I spoke to said were formed in your prefrontal cortex through experience. And the first, in fact, we can see it happening with Leo in front of us at the moment. He's, he's developing the capacity to focus his attention and he's doing it through play his own play, the, the sort of play he likes to do. And he'll keep busy doing this for hours. And that's how he's learning to concentrate, focus attention on things. And the rest of his learning is going to depend on that. The second thing he's learning to do is control his behaviour. He's um, stretching and reaching and picking things up. And he, he's beginning to self-regulate, become the, a person who can control the way he moves his body, the way he uses his mind. And the third thing is one that he's not doing at the moment, but that he'll do when he plays with you, and I've noticed when he plays with me, he's learning to read our minds, he's learning to empathise, and that will grow a lot more when he plays socially with other children as time goes on. So that, those three things start in the play that children do with the, the adults who are looking after them from the moment they're born, you know, imitating and, and laughing and, and babbling, and then it, it comes through all the play that they'll do thereafter, and it'll be different at different ages. A social play doesn't really start with other children until they're about two and a half, three. Um, and it's absolutely vital. So it's not just saying attachment's important or play's important or later on reading and writing is important. All these things, um, lots of different things that happen at different ages are important to children. If they don't get these experiences of, of, of free, <laughs> relatively, um, you know, loosely supervised rather than controlled play, um, it'll, it'll pale as time goes on in, in ways that you don't want. If, if children feel that they've got to be entertained, they won't learn to entertain themselves and they won't then learn to be self-starting, self-regulating capable, independent thinking individuals as they get older.
we think about our own relationships, what we want to do with our partners and husbands and wives and is spend time playing, is spend time laughing. You know that a relationship is in a good state, is healthy and happy. If you can see people laughing together, if you can see them exchanging little smiles together, you know that they're happy. And it, it's when that starts to go that relationships start to struggle. Our children need the same thing. They need us to be exchanging sm smiles with them, because we're, not because we're delivering a smile, but because we're enjoying their company. There's an American psychologist who's dated the change in our appreciation and understanding of play to, I think it's the 3rd of October, 1955, <laughs> which was the first day that a toy was advertised on American TV. Um, apparently, there'd been a bit of low-budget stuff during around about Christmas, but because children were not seen as a market, nobody bothered to put money into advertising toys. Once it had started, um, what this, the, the, this psychologist believes is that suddenly there was a change in adults' uh, conception of what play was. Before then, it had been something children did, and you just left them to get on with it. And OK, they'd have a few toys, but they'd just pick things up and make dens and do things and pretend. From that moment, as soon as it seemed you were being shown them to buy on the TV, you thought of it as something that children children needed something to play with and then the toy explosion began children of course took their lead from the grown-ups um, they expected something to play with and if you think about something like Lego which began as a really very helpful construction toy because if you were indoors it had many uses and, and it would originally came in a big box a whole load of pieces you just made what you know seemed to come to mind now you buy a box with a picture on the front of what you're going to make and all the ingredients and it's what's happened increasingly because of the toy explosion is adults are directing children's play more and more and more and it's turning as much adult play is these days into entertainment rather than productive inner driven play it, they're just being entertained uh, press a button something will happen um, the the advice of the American Academy of Pediatrics is that no child under two should watch TV. And I would personally say for the first two to three years, I would avoid any technological stuff at all because they need to learn to live in the real world and interact with the real world and then you can start to build the modern world on top. But they're, they're still born with this sort of Stone Age brain, you know? They've got to be initiated into this world gradually and they still need the same developmental things they've always needed. They've not changed in terms of what creatures they are. what parents find is the more toys there are the less the children play because the the play instincts being deaded deadened so then they need more toys because they're not playing as much as it we've got them more toys they might play no it's take the toys away send them out in the garden or take them down the park go for a walk in the countryside just let them go they will play So all children need is a basically a domestic environment, preferably with plenty of access to the outdoors. And they'll play with sticks and stones and leaves and grass and indoors water in a bucket. Or my daughter used to remove all the books from the bookcase, one after the other, and pile them up on the floor. They'll just play with the same things over and over again. And that is creating neural networks, prefrontal cortex focusing. Another piece of research has found that when a child is playing like that in a room and the television is on, even if the child isn't watching it, they're constantly distracted from their play by the thing that comes up on the screen. So that, that's where you learn to focus, in play and in the play that you're doing with your parent when you're copying. 
This is focused attention. And we are creating circumstances in which children are not learning to tune in, focus, control their behavior so they can do what they want to do. And when they're looking at other people, empathize. These are the three critical things. Focused attention, empathy, and self-regulation, capacity to control your behavior, all come through play. You know, it's about family, it's not about midwives, doctors, nurses, it's about them, it's about the centre of their life and that we're here to pass on through generations to keep you know, the world a better place and I think that you just have to chip away saying actually you know, it's not about having a big house, it's not about um, being able to go out, it's not about designer clothes, it's, it's about what we're here for as people, as a, as a a humankind that we are here to procreate and to bring up another generation to keep... Because this is about cycles, isn't it? Breaking cycles. Yeah. It's about breaking cycles of poverty and parenting approaches and approaches to children and babies. I understand that this is a absolutely key area of culture. You know, this is where we pass on our emotional culture to the next generation and... Um, it's really worth investing there, and it will save so much distress and money further down the line. And it's, it's about moral courage. It's about saying, no, you know, uh, I will be uh, what I feel is right for me, and I will be true in it. You're taking them from total dependence on you from the moment, at the moment they're born to some walking, talking little boy or girl that is able to go out in the world and feel secure enough in himself or herself and has played enough to know I can do this to take the part in the world with the rest of the kids. And from then on, the big parental job is to back off. That's really hard because then they've got to... You've given them self-love because you loved them and they can translate that into self-love. You've given them self-control because you gave them the control and the discipline, you showed them how to do it, and they turn that, internalize that into self-control and self-discipline. But they, you can't do that for them. They've got to do that for themselves. And that's when the play with the other kids, you've got to back off, let them sort things out for themselves. Um, you've got to accept that, yep, they've got to go out, and sometimes they'll be out of your sight. <laughs> Uh, you know, we've got to, we overprotect to a ridiculous extent and we do, we do our children as much damage with that as we would do by neglecting them. So it's this, love is about time and attention, discipline is about creating good habits, setting boundaries, explaining them what is acceptable and what's not and sticking with it. Play is where they take that from within themselves and we give them the roots to grow and the wings to fly, and off they go.